Good evening. I'm Mike Canetter, and welcome to the UW Now, where we bring you experts from the UW community speaking about timely and important topics. What could be more timely and important than a leadership transition at UW Madison? Last month, Jennifer Manukin was named 30th Chancellor of UW Madison, and she'll officially begin on August 4th. She comes to us from UCLA, which happens to be the number one ranked public university in the country, according to US News, where she's been on the faculty for 17 years, the past seven of which she's been Dean of the School of Law. Under her leadership, the law school expanded its public outreach, sharpened its focus on research, increased the diversity in the student body, and built nationally renowned centers in areas ranging from the environment and climate change to immigration to business law. That track record of success combined with a very engaging personal style made her stand out in the chancellor search process. Prior to UCLA, she served on the faculty at the University of Virginia School of Law and Harvard Law School and holds degrees from Harvard, Yale, and MIT. Fortunately for us, she happens to be visiting campus for a full week of intensive meetings with a variety of stakeholder groups, gathering perspectives on the strengths and opportunities in advance of her start date. High on that list of stakeholders, of course, are alumni and friends of the university. So Chancellor Manukin, welcome to our program and thank you for fitting us into your schedule. I know it's a pretty crazy week. Thank you, Mike. It's great to be here. <laughs> Is there anything that you would like to say before we get started with some Q&A? Only that I'm, I'm just delighted to be here, both, both sitting here with you this evening, um, but also much more generally, I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to, to lead UW-Madison. I, I'm so excited and I can't wait to get started. Well, the feeling's mutual. We're all very excited as well. And uh, it's great we're coming to you tonight from the Irwin and Linda Smith Skyview Room here at the Fluno Center for Executive Education on campus. And uh, I'll, I'll start out with a few questions about your personal background, your career history, and what was appealing about this opportunity at UW-Madison, and then maybe we'll take some questions from the live chat. Is that okay? Absolutely. It's our own version of Ask Me Anything, right? Great. Like on Twitter. Well, now that we have you on the couch, tell us about your childhood. <laughs> uh, you know, but seriously, you know, we know that what happens early in life is really important to people. And I'm just curious, could you tell us a little bit about your family, your parents, siblings, uh, where you spent your early years growing up? Just sure. A bit of a quick sketch. Sure. Uh, my parents both are from Missouri. They grew up in Kansas City and St. Louis. And they've got one of these stories where they met at 15 and got married at 20, and they're still married. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. Uh, they made their way eventually uh, first to the East Coast and then to California, which is where I mostly grew up in Berkeley and Palo Alto. Uh, I am a second generation academic. My father is also a professor. Um, mm. And uh, my mother currently does a variety of volunteer work. Uh, she did, spent a stint of her life, uh, she started off as a teacher. Uh, and then she also spent uh, a, a, a number of years running a small business. Siblings? I have one sister. Uh, she is younger than me and taller than me. Uh, she lives in Lexington, Massachusetts, and she works in the tech industry. Uh, she, she now is also a teacher. She's actually uh, circled back to that, but she spent many years working at, at Intuit um, and then uh, at some other places in technology. Great. Well, I have to say one thing that, you know, it's very personal, but I love that you pronounce the M in Manuka. Oh. You know, it's efficient. After all, your dad studied economics. <laughs> Who would want to waste a good consonant? And maybe now that you're here, people will stop calling me Mike Netter. Uh, it's true. We have that in common, we right? Do. I mean, yeah. I'm Manukin, you're Knetter. Yeah. And yet many people have dropped the M in my name too. I've been called Nukin. I've been called Mukin. Sometimes they drop the N. I don't know why. <laughs> I've been called other things, but we won't talk about those tonight. Keep it simple, um, you know? Yeah. But, I, but you know, it's kind of funny because most words that begin with KM. You don't pronounce the K. Yeah. And the only word in the English language that begins with MN, you don't pronounce the N. So we're distinctive. We are. We are. <laughs> it's, it's a great bonding fact. For exactly. Us, so. I love that. Uh, 
<laughs> so tell me a little bit when you were growing up, did you have hobbies, activities that you were involved in outside of school? Obviously, you're probably pretty good at school. Um, and, and maybe any favorite family trips or travel, you know, what, what helped you? Sure. Uh, I, one of the things we have always liked doing as a family is traveling. Um, that's been something that, that uh, I, I did do as a kid growing up. I had the chance to explore other parts of, of this country and uh, to some extent beyond. And it's something I still really enjoy and really enjoy with my own family. Uh, I also really, I like hiking. I love I love walking. I love experiencing the world on foot. I love walking around cities I don't know. I also love hiking trails and walking in, uh, in, in other kinds of environments. So I'm very excited to uh, get a chance to explore some of the, the trails of Wisconsin. Uh, I could use some suggestions about that. Yeah, I think in the live chat, we should be getting some suggestions, maybe some polling. <laughs> Uh, should should uh, Jennifer be going to the Driftless area, northern Wisconsin and the lakes, Door County, uh, the Apostle Islands in Lake Superior? Let's find out. Uh, we'll see what people think. I would. I'd love. I'd love some. I'd love ideas of some people's favorites. Where should we start? You know, we'd also like some suggestions for winter wear. We're probably not well stocked on that yet, and maybe ice fishing hotspots. Uh, so I would really love suggestions. I, I, I have spent parts of my life um, with, with winter. I spent a couple years of Chicago, in Chicago uh, a while back and some years uh, on the East Coast, but it has been a little while. And I would really, I'd, I'd love suggestions about, um, about how to best equip myself. Uh, that would be great. I'm sure we'll get some. Uh, I also love, I love, I, I like cooking and I like eating. <laughs> so I love cooking too. Well, we'll compare recipes. Excellent. Shifting gears a bit, what did you study at Harvard, uh, known as the Wisconsin of the East mm -hmm. to us? And at what point did you know you wanted to pursue law? Uh, so I, I did a, an interdisciplinary social science major. It was a little bit of economics, a little bit of uh, history, a little bit of social and political theory. Uh, a little, I, I took a statistics course. It was a very interdisciplinary major. Um, it, was, it was terrific. I learned a lot, but it also um, a lot of people who do that major do go to law school mm -hmm. because it's, it's a generalist major. Mm -hmm. Uh, I knew I was interested in law, but I was also thinking about whether I wanted to get a PhD and really uh, focus more. Mm -hmm. I couldn't quite decide, and so, um, so I did both. Now, was your father a good mentor for you? I mean, being on the faculty at Harvard Law. Uh, he didn't teach there then. Oh, okay. um, he didn't move to Harvard until until the year I got married. At that time, he oh. was a he, he, when I was growing up, he taught at Berkeley okay. and then at Stanford. Uh, so, um, but he certainly has been a source of advice and support. Um, and uh, he's been somebody that I can have great conversations with about ideas. Uh, but I, I don't always make the decisions that he approves of at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure he was all that excited about my PhD program, for example. I don't know that he thought that was a good idea. And, and actually, when I moved to Los Angeles from um, from Charlottesville, I don't think he was so keen on that either. Uh, however, this move he's thrilled about. My parents are very, very excited and very proud. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you brought something up that's very interesting to me. I know a lot of people who are on faculties at law schools. Not a lot of them have a PhD from MIT in addition to their law degree at Yale Law School. So tell me a little bit about why you did that. What was the motivation there, and how did that affect your legal career and scholarship? Uh, thanks for the question. I, I've been I've become very interested in the intersection of science and law. Um, I was a social science major. I was not a science major, but I took a few science classes uh, while in undergrad, and I even served as a teaching assistant in what I guess you would kind of call as a physics for poets class. It was mm -hmm. more a big ideas about science class. Um, and I was very interested in thinking about some of the intersections of law, science, and technology. Um, at that time, there wasn't a lot of focus on that in law schools. And I, I went to a program at MIT, at MIT that focused on the, the history and social study of science and technology so that you would embed your thinking about science and technology in the broader cultural currents. Um, 
I was unusual in combining it with law, but it was a great place to begin to explore those issues. It's probably become more important lately with artificial intelligence and other things, I would say. There are now, at many law schools, more courses that do think about law and science together, whether it's intellectual property courses or classes that do explore issues around artificial intelligence, around uh, data issues, around privacy, um, around uh, you know algorithm uh, the use of algorithms. Uh, there's now much more of that, as well as classes that look at uh, evidence and uh, science and evidence, and that's some of what I focused on in my own scholarship. Mm. So tell me what you know. Maybe two or three of your papers that you're most proud of. Maybe your most cited papers. What what did they? Uh, what what were you working on? Sure. Well, one of my favorite papers of mine. This is it's a little embarrassing because it's one of my first papers, but I really like it. It's about photography and the history of photographic evidence. What happened when suddenly the photograph became a way of proving things? Um, when when now instead of just having witnesses. You had a new technology that had a different kind of claim to be telling the truth. How did courts think about that? And what, did, what does that history tell us about the use of digital technology and even like deep fakes and things like yeah, that today? I was going to say deep fakes are a different version of right, it. Right, exactly. Or a different exactly. But it. it turns out those concerns about, about trust and fakery go all the way back huh. to the beginning of the history. Yeah. Uh, I've also done a, a lot of work around forensic science and um, some of the kinds of pattern evidence that we use in court, uh, some of which aren't as, uh, haven't gotten as much scientific study and don't have as much proven validity behind them mm -hmm. as most people might think. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that I've worked on as a scholar. But the truth is, for the last seven years, my focus has been more on leading and running a law school. Sure. Yeah, it's a full-time job. Yes. Yeah, scholarship would be a personal indulgence. A little bit. When you're a I, I, I thought I would keep a full leg in, and I think I've kept, you know, maybe up to my ankle. Maybe. Yes. <laughs> I remember when I came to Wisconsin to be business dean, I thought, oh, I'm going to keep this research going. And there was an economist here that I knew pretty well, and we're going to write a paper together. And I was like, Charles, I'm not getting anything done for you. So <laughs> right. this is not it's, happening. It, I just didn't do it. Um, you studied at three of the finest private universities in the world. But you spent your career at going on now three <laughs> different public universities, Virginia, UCLA, and now you're about to come to Wisconsin. Is that a conscious choice on your part to work at public universities? Or did it just turn out like, you know, these are great universities and you wound up there? And if it's a conscious choice, why? Uh, so the, 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 the honest answer is that the first job was sort of serendipitous. Uh, my, my spouse is also an academic, and we ended up uh, choosing that opportunity together uh, at UVA. It was a terrific and very happy home for us. But at that time, um, we were looking at some privates and some publics and saw, saw great things about both. Um, but since that time, I've become an incredible uh, supporter of the idea of the public research university and uh, that part of what I think makes America great are America's great public research universities. And so uh, when I decided to go to UCLA and then stayed at UCLA for quite a long time, and now my move here, it is uh, very much out of a passion for and a commitment to uh, public education, to the idea of the great public research university and the way that that operates as uh, both an engine of economic growth, mm. but also an opportunity for transformative learning uh, at a scale that most of the yeah. privates don't achieve. And yeah. I think that's incredibly important uh, to the state of Wisconsin and then writ large to the nation. I couldn't agree more. You know, I think about the Big Ten and how many freshmen we have at all the institutions and you know they're they're, they're not all you know harvard ready uh, of course well actually probably a lot of them are it's you know many of them are that, yeah. that, that's i don't i think that's not so much the the i mean some of them might be some of them might not be whatever it's more that this is the, the education that schools like wisconsin and ucla yeah. and many others provide can be it can be extraordinary and it can uh 
be a pathway for uh, transforming lives and opening doors and also making a real difference and having an ethos of service uh, to something greater than yourself. And I think those values are, are core to, to what we should care about as citizens. Absolutely. Yeah, the value added, I think, is just as great. And, you know, we always say that you can go anywhere with your degree from here. There's you know, no there question. really no limit to it. And we, of course, see that in our alumni population. And I tease them that, you know, here at Wisconsin, we take the riskier human capital projects. It's a noble endeavor, a noble endeavor. Well, along the arc of this fascinating career, you started a family of your own. I did. Uh, you mentioned your spouse. Can you just share a bit about your immediate family? Absolutely. So I have two kids, two children. Uh, I guess I should say two young adults now. Uh, they are 19 and 22. Uh, my 22-year-old graduated from Wesleyan University uh, in 2021. So she was pretty COVID impacted yeah. in her education. Uh, and she is back in Los Angeles. I would say that leaving her is probably the hardest thing about leaving mm -hmm. LA, but there's this thing called airplanes and we'll, mm -hmm. we'll visit each other. Um, and she is uh, in her first job after college. She, uh, she studied film and English and she would uh, like to make her way into potentially being a television or film writer. She is currently working for an agent who represents TV writers. Great. And my son is 19. He is finishing his first year in, he just finished, I should say, his first year uh, in college. He's in Chicago at New Chicago. And uh, I think he's excited that we'll be um, closer. As, as soon as he discovered that we were far enough away that there was no risk of random drop-in visits, he thought it was pretty cool that we'd be within driving distance. Well, he doesn't have to worry. We'll keep you busy. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we'll keep you busy. He can he can come up. He can come to, to Madison anytime. We'll give him a heads up if there are scheduled trips to Chicago. Yeah, exactly. All right. And Joshua, tell us about you mentioned. Yes. Uh, you know you have the dual career. Tell us a bit about his. Uh, career and my husband is also an academic he's a political scientist he focuses on uh political theory um he has written several books uh in political theory um he's written about film and politics uh he's written about pessimism he is one of the, the leading philosophical pessimists, but that doesn't mean he's no fun or grumpy. Uh, it's, it's a philosophical set of ideas, not, not a character trait. Um, and he's thinking now, he's been working on some projects around about, about humans, animals, and machines. So, uh, so he, 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 thinks, he thinks about big ideas, um, but he's also, uh, he, since I became Dean, He's also been the primary cook in our family. Mm. All right. So I enjoy cooking as well. <laughs> so I know you've been to Madison at least twice, maybe more times than that prior, but in the last five weeks or so, pretty big temperature differential, <laughs> but hopefully you've seen a few places around town. Are there any spots that you've been in Madison that you're excited to take your family? Oh, lots of them. And I'm just in the early stages of, of discovering too. So I would welcome, I would welcome suggestions. Um, I mean, so first of all, the obvious ones like the terrace, I mean, yes. that is one of the most extraordinary places to hang out on any college campus anywhere. We, yes. we, we like to think we have the best piece of real estate in the Big Ten. It, by quite a bit. Go bigger than the Big Ten. Yeah, I, I would, I would say that's pretty extraordinary. Yeah. Um, I have also walked up, I walk up and down State Street. I've gone to the farmer's market. I really enjoyed trying Stella's spicy cheese bread. That was, mm. that was a highlight. Um, and uh, I've tried a couple of the, the I've had a, a couple of the littler restaurants on State Street, um, which I've really enjoyed. Um, I have also just been, I, I got a, a chance to very briefly drive around the Arboretum. That's not the right way to see it. I need, sure. I didn't have time to get out of the car and take a look around, a but I really look forward to that very much. Great. I'm gonna shift gears to a little bit of discussion about the university. I realize you haven't been you know, in it long enough yet that we're gonna ask you about your priorities as chancellor. Um, I'm sure you're gathering evidence, but a central question I think that you know we talked about during your interview process was how the experience as a law school dean at UCLA would translate to the role of chancellor. 
And so I was wondering, could you share a bit about the areas where you feel the translation is fairly direct? And then are there some areas where you feel like maybe there's more room for you to, to grow and learn a bit more? Uh, and I guess that kind of gets at the job descriptions. And, sure. You know, how time is spent for a chancellor at Wisconsin versus dean at UCLA. Sure. What are your thoughts on that? Um, so law schools in some ways, I and mean, obviously they're embedded within universities, but there's some ways in which they're mini universities in that um, they they have a lot of the same functions. So, for example, you know, we run our own admissions. We uh, have our own student services office. We uh run our own curriculum. So a lot of the functions of a larger university are embedded within law schools more a bit more directly than in some other areas. But there's certainly a big difference in scope and scale. I mean, a law school is, and my law school, is a fraction of the size of, mm. of um, you know, the amazing scale of UW-Madison. So that's going to be a, a significant growth opportunity for me. Um, Law teams and law schools are also places for problem solving and mm -hmm. places for um, thinking about uh, about engaging across difference and thinking about the way to, the way people can talk to each other even when they don't necessarily agree. Mm -hmm. So I think some of those frameworks and skills will uh, be relevant to this new role as well. Mm -hmm. um, I also was pretty involved from my, my post as law dean all across the university. I, I chaired the group of professional school deans, that was 14 deans plus our librarian. I was very involved um, uh, with my chancellor and my provost on some bigger, broader issues of the university. So I, I think I I think one of the things I'm likely to find is that there are analogs between what I've experienced uh, at UCLA and some of what I, I will get to help uh, think about and think through here at Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. I will, of course, have to be very thoughtful and careful about the fact that just because they're analogs doesn't mean they're at all the same. Right. And so certainly I plan to start by uh, talking and to a lot of people and listening mm -hmm. carefully and broadly um, as I learn more about uh, the priorities for this campus and exactly what the most important opportunities and challenges are. Well, you've asked some great questions already in the meetings I've been at, so thank you. Um, I see we're getting some alumni questions coming in. I've got a couple more and then uh, we'll we'll move on to those and we've got plenty of time yet. Um, so five or eight or ten years from now, what would success look like for Chancellor at UW? Uh, Great. Uh, I think uh, I think I'd love to see us achieve a few a few things together. Um, one is I'd like to see this incredibly strong academic uh, this set of academic programs be even one step stronger. I mean, I think already there is so much excellence here at Wisconsin across so many different fields. Uh, but but you know, I'm kind of a competitive person, and the last published ratings, uh, Wisconsin was right below UCLA for total research expenditures. Mm -hmm. Let's see that flip. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, that would be, that would be a, a, a nice thing. Um, I also think that uh, diversity and inclusion across campus and every student feeling a sense of belonging, uh, racial diversity is one piece of that, but also rural urban also across political difference, also religious diversity, gender identity, all kinds of ways of thinking. One of the amazing things about universities is that they bring people together from very different backgrounds. And that project of bringing together a diverse community and also helping people learn how to learn from one another is something that I think, uh, I think this campus has already made significant strides, but I'd love to see um, go even further. I also am incredibly excited by the Wisconsin idea. I mean, this is one of the most amazing parts of this university. Um, but I, I think there's more to tell and do and share both within the state and beyond the state about the tremendous ways that what's happening at this university uh, can have an impact 
uh, beyond its walls. None of these are, are new things. These are all building on um, matters that I think are already significant strengths. Um, I also think that, that, that UW-Madison is going to need more resources in order to succeed at these. Um, and so building, finding ways to build those resources uh, so that uh, this university can uh, be all that it's capable of mm -hmm. is another important thing to focus on. I love that answer. Yeah, those are uh, all great points. And, you know, I often think how fortunate I am to work at a place where I really get to interact with people on all sides of different mm -hmm. issues. And, you know, not everyone has a chance to do that anymore in the world that we live in. And, um, you know, it's kind of on us, I think, to try to make something of that opportunity and uh, help get people back to better ways of interacting uh, over difference. Right? I, from your lips to anybody who's listening's ears, I think that's that's absolutely true. Yeah, um, we've got some audience questions coming in, and I have to go to my friend Susan Stemper in Maine. Um, she wonders whether you could tell us about one of the most valuable and eye-opening things that you've learned from students during your career. Wow, it's a wonderful question, and there are so many answers to that and so many ways to answer that. I think I will give two quick responses. One is that I have had students ask incredibly insightful questions, even in classes where I've been teaching it for years. And the way that students can uh, show us something new about materials that we already understand as scholars and teachers is a reminder that we're in this education together. It's not, um, it's not just didactic, it's not from, from professor to student, but rather it's about um, intellectual engagement across. A second answer though, is that I've also seen students who come to universities from such different perspectives and positions um, there are some who have uh, plenty of, of uh, you know, money to afford to go out for pizza one night and uh, to buy themselves the winter coat that they need and support from their uh, parents if something's going wrong. And there's others who come with much, much more fiscal challenge or from much more challenging circumstances. And the kind of... Um, uh, potentially unequal playing fields that people have before they get here and that can still play out while they're here is also something that I've learned about from students and that we at universities have to think through when we're working to support our students. Uh, question from Gail Ford. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a bit about your commitment to making college more affordable for mid to low income families in Wisconsin? Thank you. Um, so I want to, there's so much that I uh, like and respect and admire about uh, Chancellor Becky Blake, who I'm following. And one of the things that I love is Bucky's Tuition Promise as a starting point for that question and that set of issues. I think it's incredibly uh, important and valuable uh, to have uh, strong financial aid for families in need. The question of whether we can go further than that and how I think is a really important one. Looking at debt load and keeping debt load manageable and reasonable, ideally, you know, the perfect debt load is zero, but can't always achieve that, um, is, uh, is something to keep, to keep our eye on and keep looking at. It is something that is a relative strength here compared to many other universities. A smaller percentage of Wisconsin grads are uh, leading with, with uh, substantial debt, and already there is uh, pretty strong financial aid uh, through Bucky's tuition promise, but that doesn't mean there's not more we would like to do and want to do and hope to do, resources permitting. Navigating that triangle that we always talk about of excellence, affordability, and access, you know, that that's uh, the challenge of the big public university. Question and we from, need them all. We do they need all, them all. They, we, all three points of that triangle exactly. are core. Exactly. Uh, Joe Stoller uh, out in New York, uh, how do you plan to approach state relations and work with our partners on the other end of State Street, who I guess some of them rolled out quite a greeting when you were named and, uh, you know, you uh, handled that very, very well. And I know uh, you'll, you'll do 
just fine. But how do you uh, think about that work? You know, Wisconsin is, I'd say, a bit more of a 50-50 divided state uh, than you're used to in California and maybe presents a different challenge. Any thoughts about that? Fair question. I'm looking forward to meeting and working with everybody and anybody who's game to meet and work with me. I think that we... Uh, need to look for and find the things that connect us. Um, we don't always have to agree with each other on everything to be able to have constructive, productive, thoughtful working relationships. You know, that said, I understand that during election season, uh, that can have its own momentum and its own drama, but I'm really looking forward to working with a, a broad range of, uh, of folks within the community and uh, down State Street. You'll have a, another uh, partner in that who's also new mm -hmm. to the role in UW system, President Jay Rothman. Um, you've obviously met President I Rothman. Uh, you think he'll be a great partner in that work for you? I'm really, I, I'm very optimistic that we'll have a strong partnership. Uh, I've had a number of meetings with Jay. Uh, he's obviously not at all new to Wisconsin, but right. he's new to higher ed. Uh, I'm. Uh, new to Wisconsin, but not to higher ed. And we both have um, legal training and the recognition of the importance of problem solving and talking across difference as a shared uh, lens of understanding. So I'm looking forward uh, to working with him to make both UW-Madison and the system as strong as we can. I think it's a great opportunity for us to maybe reset on some kind of shared vision for what it is the state wants from us and. Uh, then let's focus on how we go about This university together. has been one of this state's strengths. And I mean, I see that as somebody who hasn't spent my life here, that this university uh, has been, there's just no question that it's been an economic driver for the state, that it's uh, that, that it's a mechanism that, that um, helps keep incredibly talented uh, Wisconsinites here in the state. It's also sometimes a net importer of incredible talent. And so I hope we can tell a shared uh, story of, of those benefits um, and, uh, and help uh, ensure that an even broader swath of the community understands the contributions that the university makes. Let's continue with the who's who of our live stream <laughs> audience. Richard Chian, how do you see alumni playing a role in the university and how can alumni help advance overall university priorities? Thank you, Richard Chian, for that fabulous question. And thank you to, to everybody who's listening in and all of the alums and friends who care about this institution and who participate in events like this. And uh, I look forward to meeting many of you in person. Um, that's the beginning of my answer, uh, Richard, to your question. I think alums play such an important role for universities in a few different ways. Uh, one of them is as supporters and cheerleaders, uh, if they had a good experience here, for sharing that with the world, wherever they are now, and uh, helping uh, the next generation of students to understand just what a strong university this is, um, for hiring uh, UW grads and uh, making um, those connections for networking with them and offering mentoring, um, and also, of course, philanthropic support. Uh, public universities, um, the, the, the ingredient that makes it possible for us to be a great public university rather than a merely a uh, good one is philanthropy, and it is the generosity of alums uh, giving back and getting involved uh, in any way they can. And we're here to try to pour gas on all that affinity <laughs> that they bring. So um, Phil Greenwood from the business school, there's a blast from the past for me. <laughs> Phil, how are you? Chancellor Manukin, if you were to make an initial address to UW employees, faculty and staff, what theme would you most like to focus on? So, Phil, that's a great question and one that I, I, I have to give just a pretty preliminary answer to at this point because uh, I'm going to be doing a lot of uh, listening uh, first. But I would say talking about the, the public service mission and the Wisconsin idea, um, I mean, that's something people already understand as being central to this, uh, this place and this, this university. But um, reminding faculty and staff of all of the ways in which they are already making contributions bigger than themselves, uh, 
doing incredible research. I mean, just this week, um, I've begun to have a few meetings around campus and I've been hearing about such amazing ways that the work that goes on here is making a difference. Um, and I think right at the moment, if I were to talk to the community, I'd want to reflect back some of those great things and also ask the question about how can we do even, even more of that and um, make sure that all of our, our students and all of our community is included in those efforts. I'm going to jump back to something personal. Um, if someone named an ice cream in your honor, <laughs> What flavors would it have? Oh, I don't know. That's a great question. Um, I it might be more relevant than you realize. I I uh, I haven't gotten to try Babcock ice cream yet, but I'm I'm looking forward to that. I'm I also have to say, and I, I'm a dairy fan. I love ice cream, and I also love cheese. So I I think we've I'm in the right it. place. We've got um, it. Yes. I. Uh, I like a lot of different flavors of ice cream, but I do have a particular, the, the range of mint flavors are um, are some of my favorites. So. All right. Well, that gives us a start, mint. Anything else? Uh, I like coffee ice cream. I like, I like, uh, I like, um, I like ice cream that has goodies in it. I'm really excited to try, I guess it's an orange custard chip. That's oh, probably yeah. of the flavors that I've seen. Orange and chocolate together, um, that's that's an unbeatable combination. Okay. Well, it might be time to go in the lab and concoct something new. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. Uh, Christopher Snyder wonders, are there pets in the Manukin household? There are. Uh, my, my family, we have a dog. Uh, Remember that my husband is a political philosopher, um, and so our dog is named Plato. Not the children's toy, but the philosopher. <laughs> my husband did not name this dog. My kids did, because they had a friend, at the, uh, friends at the time, who had a dog named Aristotle. And we said to our kids that any name they could agree on, we'd go with. That was a little bit dangerous at the ages that they were. It could have ended up with who knows what. Um, but Plato is about... Um, probably about 12 years old. He's a rescue, so I don't know exactly. He's mostly cockapoo, but there's probably a little bit of other, something else in there too. And uh, Plato will uh, be, be moving to Madison with us. And uh, I can't tell you whether he's excited or not about it because he hasn't told me. He's reflecting on it. Exactly. As he should. <laughs> um, a few people in the chat have asked about how you get out of, how you plan to get out of the Madison bubble, which I guess Sometimes Dane County is described as 77 square miles surrounded by reality by people in other parts of the state. <laughs> so do you have any plans to travel the state and uh, any thoughts about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. I, I really want to get to know uh, the state as a whole. I'd like to try to visit all of the other schools that are part mm -hmm. of, uh, of the University of Wisconsin system. And I'd really like to, to visit um, I hope before too long, I'll get a chance to visit virtually every county. I mean, that will take some time. I'm not gonna promise that that, 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 that won't happen in the first 30 sure. or 60 days, but, I, but... I, 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 there's no question. I also loved, I learned about the bus tour that uh -huh. some new faculty yeah. take, where they get a chance to uh, get out of that Madison bubble and explore the state. Um, I think that's, that's kind of an amazing thing. And I very, very much want to to, to get to know the state as a whole. Let's wrap things up. I know you've got plans this evening ahead of you, but uh, what's your zodiac sign? I'm a Gemini. You are a Gemini. I am. So uh, <laughs> when's your birthday? Today. Today. <laughs> yes. Well, I guess we knew that. <laughs> yes. I guess we did know that, but happy birthday, Chancellor Thank Manukin. you. Thank you we so have much. a little something here for you, oh. which you don't need to open on set, but... Um, <laughs> You know, we really appreciate you taking the time to do this. It's a busy week. It's your birthday. I know you've got a dinner reservation with Joshua. Oh, it's, it's going to be a great dinner. Um, a lovely place. I know you're going. So it's my absolute pleasure. Uh, I'm delighted to spend my birthday here, and um, thank you so much for having me on, on this discussion show tonight. Well, uh, and we will do it again, not too soon. We'll give you a little time to. Uh, get your thoughts together. I know you're doing some great due diligence with various stakeholder groups, but as things begin to gel, I'm sure we're going to want to have you back on and 
share more with alumni about your thoughts and plans. Thank you. And again, thank you to those listening and for those uh, alums and others uh, who are involved in the institution. Um, in addition to all of the ways that you can support the school, you can share advice and uh, help us understand what, what the institution can do still better. So thank you so much for having me tonight. Uh, and I think we're going to be on a mission with those those uh, consonants. At the we are. Of our last names. We are. Yes. <laughs> They're never going to mispronounce my name again actually, <laughs> now that you're here. Thank you. But thanks to our audience for joining us tonight. Uh, and we look forward to being back again very soon on Wisconsin. On Wisconsin. You can try, but you'll never stop a badger. Because we badgers are born with curious minds and endless heart. When we see a curve in the road, we speed up. When there are mass shortages for first responders, we make our own supply chain. When there's a world on pause, we sharpen our claws. Through thunder, fire, and pandemics, we'll keep going. Because after all, you can't stop a badger.